All right, good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Matt Jones and I'm the MLA for Calgary Southeast. I'm so happy to be with you all this morning at the Glenbow for a special announcement. The Glenbow has been a staple of Calgary and Alberta for decades. It began when one man's collection was donated to the province of Alberta out of a desire to share Alberta's rich history with anyone who wished to discover it. I'm honoured to be joined by the Honourable Jason Kenney, Premier of Alberta, the Honourable Leela Sharon Ahir, Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism and the Status of Women, the Honourable Minister Prasad Panda, Minister of Infrastructure, Nicholas Bell, President and CEO of the Glenbow Museum, as well as the board members and staff who help keep the Glenbow open and accessible to all Albertans. Now please help me welcome the Honourable Jason Kenney, Premier of Alberta, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for that introduction. Thanks to the whole Glenbow community for welcoming us to this uh, cultural jewel in Alberta. Thanks uh, to Ministers Ahir and Ponda uh, as well for their presence. Uh, as we are gathered in a museum that is a vital repository of our proud history, I'd like to begin by recounting the story of its founder, Eric Harvey, an Ontario born and raised lawyer and combat veteran of the First World War. Harvey moved to Alberta permanently after the war and he built a law practice here while dabbling in the oil and gas industry in those days when a lot of dry wells were drilled uh, and a lot of hopes were lost. But he persevered and then ultimately the remarkable uh, 1947 Leduc No. 1 uh, well was struck on February 13, 1947, making Harvey incredibly rich and launching Alberta on a path to unprecedented growth and prosperity. Uh, Mr. Harvey was an extraordinarily generous man, extraordinarily generous with his wealth. In fact, he vowed to, quotes, die broke. I don't know if he managed that, but he certainly gave an awful lot of what he generated to some of our province's biggest and best cultural institutions, including the Banff Centre, uh, Heritage Park here in Calgary, uh, and, um, of course, $5 million plus his vast collection of art and artifacts uh, to found this, the Glenbow Alberta Institute in 1966. I think this is a story worth recalling for a, a number of reasons. It reminds all of us that much of what we value about modern Alberta was built by folks like Mr. Harvey and other adventurous, successful entre entrepreneurial mavericks many of whom are profiled here in the permanent exhibition of, this, uh, of the same name using wealth generated by our bountiful supply of natural resources. Another reason to retell Harvey's story is because we're repeating some of that history here today. His founding $5 million donation to the Glenbow, $40 million in today's money, was matched by Premier Ernest Manning's government of the day. And that financed the construction of this building, which opened back in 1976. It has served our province very well over the past four and a half decades, but it is way overdue uh, to uh, undergo a new vision and a major upgrade. Uh, the leaky roof and structural decay in this building are a serious threat to the invaluable cultural treasures that are stored here treasures that belong to the people and the province of Alberta. I understand that something like 99% of the collection uh, is not on public display because there's not enough space, and the invaluable collection in the floors above us, which belong to the people of Alberta, which likely have a, a notional monetary value of tens of millions of dollars, but an inestimable cultural value, their safety is threatened if we do not invest in renewing this building, this institution. It is therefore time for government and private philanthropists to come together once again, as we did in the 1960s and 70s, to revitalize the Glenbow, to ensure that it is here for generations and decades to come to guarantee its future as one of the central cultural institutions of this province, one of the repositories of our history, uh, and one uh, of the greatest tourism draws in the future in this uh, province. Uh, and so I am very pleased to announce today that the government of Alberta is committing $40 million to facilitate major upgrades and the complete renewal of the Glenbow.
This will help the Glenbow achieve its goal of raising a total of $115 million, and we hope uh, that uh, the provincial contribution will be matched uh, by a federal contribution uh, of an equal amount. And we encourage the City of Calgary uh, to support this central core cultural institution in the centre of this Alberta's largest city. Uh, with uh, the support, we hope, of generous private donors, uh, and I believe today's commitment will make it much easier for the board, the volunteer board, to go out and find those contributions. We believe that we can revitalize this building and transform the museum into a world-class public art gallery in Calgary. You know, Calgary is the only major city in Canada without a uh, significant standalone public art gallery. And that is not acceptable. And the vision of the board and the new uh, executive team here uh, at the Glenbow is to give us that world-class art gallery which puts Calgary even more on the global cultural map. We believe that will help in achieving our vision of doubling tourism uh, to Alberta in the years to come. And it will be a sign that even during tough times, even during a time of fiscal restraint, Albertans are prepared to invest in our quality of life, in our cultural life for, for decades to come. And uh, it is also an obligation of our generation to preserve the collection of this museum, which is now increasingly under threat because of a lack of investment in the structure of this building for nearly five decades. So with the transfer of the Glenbow's priceless library and archives and its indigenous history materials to the University of Calgary, this project will also help the museum reinvent itself, as I say, as a dedicated public art museum. With its fabulous art collection of art, include, including some of the most inspiring landscape paintings of the great Northwest, and an amazing array of indigenous arts, much of which you can see in this room, along with its incredibly varied collection of Alberta and international, or sorry, and historical artifacts, the Glenbow is ready to take its place as one of the top cultural institutions in Canada in a new and stronger way. Upwards of 150,000 people a year visit this, the museum. They learn a lot about who we are, about where we come from, about our stories. And honestly, as an Albertan, you cannot come away from this place without feeling proud of our history and proud of the people who went before us, beginning with our Indigenous people. Um, and I, I want to commend the Board and Administration of the Glenbow for having achieved uh, surpluses in recent years, uh, having adopted a new business plan, brought new visitors to this place, and we want to, as a government, to encourage that kind of entrepreneurial uh, success in our cultural institutions. For two years running, The Economist magazine has rated Calgary as the most livable city in North America. And folks, as I go for, to Toronto and Montreal, Wall Street, Bay Street, uh, London, and around the country and across the world to attract new investment to this province, part of the value proposition isn't just that we have low taxes, isn't just that we have an entrepreneurial culture, but it's also that we have a remarkable standard of living, a quality of life, in part because of cultural institutions like this. So uh, I am so excited by uh, the uh, vision of, uh, of the Glenbow Board, um, of the revitalization of this core cultural institution. Uh, the Government of Alberta has made significant investments in recent years uh, in supporting uh, our, our cultural institutions and preserving our history for future generations, like the recently opened Royal uh, on Alberta Museum uh, in, in Edmonton, which was the result of a huge contribution by the, government, the taxpayers of Alberta, and uh, the Alberta Art Gallery in Edmonton, and other cultural institutions around the province. But if we cannot, if we cannot preserve and protect this museum that belongs to the people of Alberta and its collection, this is a an ob a moral obligation of our time, and that is why even during challenging fiscal times, we have made this important uh, decision. So I look forward to uh, being here uh, in a couple of years. Let's get it done quickly, Nick. <laughs> To see, to see uh, the vastly new and improved Glenbow that will be there uh, for generations to come. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Premier. I would now like to invite the Honourable Leela here, Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism and the Status of Women, to say a few words. Thank you, Emily Jones, uh, Premier Nicholas, and uh, Minister Panda. It's such a huge privilege to be with you today, especially in this beautiful room. You can see some of the incredible art that's on display here. I'd also like to acknowledge our Indigenous partners, our Métis and Inuit uh, brothers and sisters and First Peoples. We uh, acknowledge the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Siksika and Pikani and Kainai, Tsutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including Chiniki, Wesley and Bears Paw Bands, and the Métis Nation Region 3. It's so proud for us to be able to stand here on these shared properties. And as the Premier always says, our first people were the very first people who traded and lived and were the first entrepreneurs of this province. So it's a huge privilege for us to be able to share this space. Je vous remercie d'être ici ce matin pour assister à cette importante annonce. It is such a privilege to be here as Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism and the Status of Women. Albertans are cultures from all over the world and our first peoples. And whether you just got off the airplane yesterday and are a brand new Albertan or Canadian, or whether you've been here for generations, this space is for you. And les Albertans et les Albertines représentent des cultures partout sur la terre. Notre histoire est enrichie de leurs récits où s'entremêlent l'outre et triomphe, the pain and the beauty the amount of time that we've spent becoming Canadians and Albertans and the great sacrifice that is made by so many to be here. Those stories have shaped our communities and they, it's given us the province that we truly love today. And that's why the gunboat holds, holds a very special place in my heart. I've been coming here since I was a child. And uh, whenever I visit, I learn something new, not about the world in the past, but also about future artists and future musicians and the people who form the cultural basis of this province. Um, when I was a child, there were so many sig significant pieces, but one of the things that the Glenbow does so well is repatriation. Uh, it's very, very important of First Nations pieces and collections, but also, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to see the new installation of Vivian Mayer, and, the, and through the eyes of so many of these new artists that view the world in a very unique and, and, and very beautiful way, which gives us pause to look at who we are as a culture. The Glenbow's founding purpose was to promote and encourage the knowledge of the human race, its arts, its history, and the nature of the world in which we live in. And there's arts and textiles, and as the Premier was saying, and the historical objects, and to know that they could be at risk for not having this infrastructure built is heartbreaking. And uh, Premier, just to, it's $163 million worth of, uh, is the value of, of, the, of the collection that we have here. So it's not a small collection, and as the Premier was saying, this collection actually belongs to Albertans. It's your collection. And we have a responsibility to make sure and protect and maintain this for future generations. So, c'est uh, évalué à plus de 163 millions dollars. It's a huge investment. It's a huge Canadian and Albertan investment. And Alberta deserves to have, and a Calgary deserves to have, a space where we really truly show who we are as artists and the culture and to really be able to attract people to come here for jobs and prosperity, but to stay because their livelihoods are honored and respected in this province. We stay for culture, we stay for arts, we stay for the beautiful things that we have here that's part of our livelihood. So um, the $40 million capital funding is an important investment and will ensure long-term sustainability to this beautiful space. And will ensure that the art that is held within these walls will be enjoyed by generations of Albertans to come. So our government believes in this project. We believe it is crucial to preserve our memories and our collective stories. For all Albertans, these are our arts and our culture. With spaces like the Glenbow, I'm absolutely certain we'll be able to share these with tremendous pride. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Minister. And now I'd like to invite Minister Prasad Panda uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, I'm really happy to join the Premier, uh, Premier Kenny, Minister Rahir, and MLA Jones on this important announcement. As uh, Minister of uh, Infrastructure, um, I'm 
I'm very pleased to join this announcement because projects like this will create jobs and grow the economy. And uh, Premier actually put, I mean, he, like he said, in, even during uh, challenging fiscal times, we're uh, finding it, um, you know, important to fund projects like this. Um, so, uh, as you know, we Premier promised uh, guaranteed funding for health and education and other social uh, services like communities, seniors and housing and mental health. So that put departments like infrastructure and culture in a tight spot to find finance to fund projects like this. But he also convinced us saying projects like this will improve quality of life, which will attract investments when he's doing a sales pitch in, uh, in uh, London and uh, outside of uh, Canada in, in these difficult times. So we are committed to continue build uh, critical infrastructure projects, um, mostly healthcare and uh, learning facilities in education, and also some museums like this, um, because that will uh, create jobs and grow the economy. But we are going to partner with all levels of government, uh, City of Calgary, particularly federal government, which has an obligation to partner with us, because uh, it's not just the three levels of governments. There is a lot of uh, private uh, philanthropists and entrepreneurs who, who are generous in the past, but now because of these economic conditions that is uh, crippling their capacity to contribute, we hope our uh, federal government take note of that and work with our government, but we are happy to fund this project and I look forward to work with the Board of Glenbow to finish this project on time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. And now Nicholas Bell, President and CEO of the Glenbow, will say a few words. Thank you, Emily Jones. Thank you, Premier Kenny. Thank you, Ministers Panda and Ahir. It is an honor to stand with you on such an auspicious day for Alberta. As a new Albertan, I've only been here a few months, <laughs> I feel particularly humbled to speak on behalf of our staff, our Board of Governors, and the many supporters who have given so much of themselves to make this museum exceptional. Today's announcement is transformational for the future of culture in Alberta. It not only allows us to address critical issues with our building and in the protection of the province's collections, your collections, it also provides an unprecedented opportunity to revisit how this museum can better serve our community. Glenbow has witnessed the extraordinary growth of this city and province over the span of our institutional life, while welcoming millions of Albertans through our doors since our founding more than 50 years ago. We recognize the value museums bring to all peoples as sites for the discovery of meaning in the world around us. This is where we reconcile our past with our turbulent present and seek clues to a common future. In that spirit, your support permits us to embark on a new journey at Glenbow, to reimagine how these rich collections and this space can be activated in our drive to create one of the most ambitious and progressive museum programs in North America. Investing in spaces that encourage and inspire such dialogues isn't just good for conversation. It's also good for business. Supporting Glenbow ensures our institutional sustainability while underscoring the role culture will play in contributing to our economic recovery. Infrastructure isn't just roads, airports, or trains. We invest in culture because it creates jobs and attracts the talent we need to help Alberta grow and thrive for the future. Building this cultural infrastructure increases Alberta's relevance on the global stage. We know public support for culture lays the foundation for civic engagement and understanding that strengthens a society. Across Canada and the world, people we haven't yet met are asking themselves, should I move to Alberta? What will I find there? Should I do business there? What are this province's values? Today's critical support from the province and people of Alberta sends the right message, that we are doubling down on a half century of success at Glenbow to lay the groundwork for the next 50 years. All of us will benefit. Premier, 
ministers. You have breathed new life into one of Canada's leading museums at a time when Albertans are hungry for signs that we remain strong as a community. Every person who has experienced Glenbow and those we will welcome in the future can celebrate this news and it's on behalf of them that we thank you today. Thank you. That concludes the announcement portion of this event. I will now turn it over to the Press Secretary for the Premier, Christine Myatt, for the Q&A. All right, uh, just a reminder that there is a mic to your right, um, and we ask that you use that. And uh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, short people problems. <laughs> um, Mr. Premier, a big story that dropped yesterday was the uh, Buffalo Declaration from a group of uh, Calgary MPs. Um, what are your feelings around this and sort of using this, this threat of separation to force uh, uh, a better deal, in their words, from the federal government? Our government was elected on a mandate to fight for Alberta. That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, it's exactly why we're in court challenging the federal carbon tax, challenging the No More Pipelines Law, Bill C-69. It's why we launched the Fair Deal panel, uh, and it's why we are prepared to go to Albertans with a number of ideas to uh, maximize our autonomy as a province, to defend our right to, to develop responsibly our resources. Uh, and uh, that work is being done by the Fair Deal panel right now. So our focus is on uh, listening to Albertans about how they think we can get be best get a fair deal in the Federation. Uh, and uh, we will be having more news in the throne speech to come next week uh, and in the legis legislature session to begin next week. Um, so uh, I, I want Albertans to understand, however, that we do have allies across the country, that uh, all 13 prem premiers have agreed with the concept of energy and resource corridors that need to get built. Uh, that uh, nine of the ten provinces are supporting our fight against the federal bill C-69, that I think six or seven provinces are supp supporting us in our fight against the imposition of a federal carbon tax, a decision of which will come out of, from the Court of Appeal next week. Um, and uh, 13 for 13 provinces and territories support the concept of uh, the vision for liquefied natural gas to help to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions while creating jobs here at home. So um, we've made it as clear as day uh, to the Prime Minister and his government that uh, Albertans d not only expect but demand respect and fairness in this federation uh, and that we are prepared to act if we end up with federal policies that further injure our economy, uh, for example, uh, uh, should the uh, tech mine not be approved. So we're focused. On, on, on practical ways uh, to fight for fairness in the Federation. And uh, since you're giving such full-throated support for this, uh, this fair deal as your Premier right now, how come you didn't uh, seem to have such uh, fervent support while you were an MP, particularly, in the past? Well, I, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I was part of a federal government that did not impose a carbon tax in Alberta, that didn't impose a no more pipelines law in Alberta, uh, that did, in fact, uh, add additional federal seats to Alberta, that did appoint out senators elected by Albertans, that increased uh, by a billion dollars Alberta's annual health transfer, uh, and did so on a per capita basis. I belong to a federal government that gave our prairie farmers marketing freedom for their grain, that repealed the liberal long arm registry, which penalized law abiding Alberta hunter, hunters and farmers. Uh, I belong to a, a government that was elected with massive majorities by Albertans because they approved of what we did for fairness in the Federation. Uh, Premier, uh, can you respond to criticism that uh, your government's move to end the AMA agreement and push through with these changes um, is hurting patient care and could drive some physicians out of the province? Uh, so let's put this in context. There it will be zero reduction in physician compensation and zero cuts to health care. In fact, our health care budget is going up. What we're doing is slowing the growth in health spending. Because uh, as a province, we are facing an $8 billion deficit. We're headed, if we don't take action, to $100 billion in debt. That means spending billions more on interest payments to bankers and bondholders and less on infrastructure, schools, hospitals, and physician services in the health system. Uh, that is uh, both uh, Dr. McKinnon's panel and uh, the independent Ernst Young performance report of Alberta Health Services uh, confirmed 
that Alberta has the by far the most expensive health system in Canada, but not the results to, to justify that. We have lower than average life expectancy, higher than average infant mortality, and longer than average surgical wait times, even though we spend 20% more per person than the average amongst Canadian provinces. The single largest reason for that uh, is compensation. 55% of the $55 billion spent by Alberta's government goes to public sector compensation and benefits. The largest single portion of that is physician compensation. As uh, the McKinnon panel uh, underscored, uh, Alberta physicians are by far the best compensated in Canada. And we honour and respect those physicians, our medical practitioners, as well as our nurses and everybody in our health system. Many of them do heroic work every day. We recognised that just two days ago by our announcement to uh, uh, virtually double the Lougheed uh, uh, Medical Center Emergency Ward. Um, and we recognize it in our commitment to maintain health spending and maintain physician compensation. But we cannot allow um, that physician compensation to, to, to continue to grow much, much faster than our population or than inflation at a time of real fiscal and economic challenge. So we are turning to uh, the, uh, our, our great doctors to say, please work with us to find more uh, efficient way of delivering services, uh, fair ways to be compensated. Um, according to the McKinnon panel, the average GP in Alberta grosses nearly $100,000 more than the average amongst GPs across the country. In today's current fiscal situation, that is not sustainable. The vision of our Minister of Health, Minister Shandro, is significantly to increase uh, the percentage of our physicians, our GPs, who are compensated through alternative um, reimbursement plans, like as we committed to Albertans in our election platform to replicate the great success of the, um, uh, the health, in, in your constituency, it's the Chinook? Oh. Crowchild, the Crowchild Health Network, Primary Health Network, where they're compensated through ARPs. They get better results at lower cost. We want to see that spread across the province, and we want to work uh, thoughtfully and constructively with our physicians to make that happen. And just um, and a second question, just uh, your response to reports out there of more than 40 Nobel laureates calling on the Canadian government to reject the uh, Tech Frontier proposal. Well, I, I think that, that often you see these mass letters signed by folks who don't live in Canada and don't uh, uh, always understand the details. In this instance, the Frontier Tech Mine pr would operate at 50% of the carbon intensity of an average barrel of oil produced in North America. Uh, and 50% of the average barrel of bitumen produced in the uh, Canadian oil sands. Uh, because of the application of cutting edge technology, the Tech Frontier Mine is supported by all 14 nearby First Nations in Northern Alberta. Chief Alan Adam of the uh, Athabasca, Athabasca Fort Chippewa uh, Nation just reconfirmed that uh, yesterday uh, on, uh, in media. And so um, uh, those First Nations see this $20 billion investment that would create 7,500 jobs and create $70 billion of government revenue uh, as uh, an opportunity to move their people from poverty to prosperity. And we embrace the, the imperative of reconciliation. Reconciliation, first and foremost, means giving Aboriginal people a way out of poverty. And the partnerships that have been signed with, the, with Tech Mines, the most, one of the most progressive mining companies in the world, with, uh, with the highest, amongst the highest rankings for corporate social responsibility and an environmental and social governance standards amongst the, the global mining industry. Tech has committed, by the way, to a net zero carbon uh, plan by uh, 2050 as a, as a, a global uh, uh, company. I suspect these are facts that many of those signatories were not presented when they signed that letter. I suspect they were presented with a distorted um, view of, of, of this project. But let me tell you, in this province, um, we can't sustain infrastructure like this without revenue like that. It's just that simple.
Um, I just want to go back to health for one second. As you mentioned, $5.4 billion, that's staying the same. Uh, but a lot of physicians are convinced that this, in the long run, is going to mean more work for them and, and less money in their pockets. So my question is, especially after Bill 21 and, and yesterday's announcement, what are you doing to restore the confidence of, of health workers in this province? Well, I, I think uh, what we're doing, first of all, um, the minister has listened to concerns and has brought in a, a gradual path for transitioning to a more sustainable model of compensation. I think there was, um, uh, frankly, some, well, let's, I'll be diplomatic and call it misunderstandings about the government's intention. Uh, and so, uh, for example, uh, one point of contention was on uh, changing the time to, before uh, physicians can charge what's called an extra charge for complex modifiers from 15 to, I think, 25 minutes. And, and, and he's delayed, he announced that will not happen for at least a year. Um, in the meantime, we'll be uh, accelerating the opportunity for those GPs to move to ARP, a, a form of compensation, uh, including capitation, like the Crow Child Medical, a primary medical network Crowfoot. here, Crowfoot, uh, here in, in Calgary. So um, I think once, uh, well, you know what, I think once our physicians sit down and actually look at what the province will be offering, they'll see that this is entirely reasonable. I'm confident they will, they, they will still end up being the best compensated physicians in Canada. So I'm not sure where the, the people talk about leaving the province. If they want to leave the province with the best compensation and the lowest taxes, uh, I hope they wouldn't do so, but it wouldn't be very sensible, wouldn't be a very logical decision to make. Um, at the end of the day, the proof is in the numbers. Our budget for, the, for Alberta Health Services, our budget for physician compensation is not going down by one penny. Um, and then I guess off that a little bit, whether it's health care or education, especially before the budget, are there any plans to, I guess, bring more incentives so people outside the province want to come to Alberta and work here? Uh, maybe we can particularly focus on rural health care because that's a point of contention. Well, that's the obsession of our government is getting the start economy going again. And here's some good news. Uh, Alberta's uh, population is growing again. Uh, we're projected to have uh, amongst the highest uh, rate of population growth in the country uh, this year in 2020. Um, and so people, notwithstanding our challenges, they, they know Alberta as a place of opportunity and they see the signs of hope and optimism for the years to come. Um, and one of the ways we do that is by keeping competitive tax rates. Um, you know, uh, uh, our opposition, uh, apparently they want us to spend, to sp they, they think it's not a good enough that our physicians make $100,000 more on average than they do in other provinces. Instead, they want to raise taxes on those physicians. I, I, it, 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 they want to spend more and tax more and borrow more. That is not the path to prosperity. Hi there. When uh, the issue of uh, unpaid property taxes by oil and gas firms sort of boiled up, you made some comments about how the government would work with municipalities. Has there been any progress on that? And what? On, on which? I'm sorry. On so the issue of unpaid property taxes from oil and gas companies to rural municipalities. Okay. There was some discussion about how the province would work with municipalities. Has there been any progress on that? Any work done? Um, what do you have to say to? These well, I, I think that to those discussions are ongoing. I, I think that Minister Madhu just met with the uh, president of the Rural Municipalities Association uh, earlier this week. Um, I will be uh, speaking to, uh, I think, the spring RMA conference coming up. And, uh, and so those conversations are ongoing. I can tell you that the province, it's, uh, we unilaterally provided uh, linear property tax relief to dry gas producers uh, earlier this year. I think it was in the range of, of $25 million retroactively while we work on a new assessment model. Because here's the problem. The, the current, the, old, the decades old assessment model is um, based on a totally different world. Through much of the past five years, our gas, dry gas producers have been losing money with rock bottom prop, uh, prices, often negative prices. And yet their valuations are based on uh, on a totally different price environment. So we don't want to see all those, ga those gas producers go bust, and then guess what happens? The municipalities have no source of revenue. So we, that, that's why we're working on new assessment rules. We're doing so in collaboration and consultation with the rural municipalities. And uh, in the meantime, we are extending our, our, our tax relief uh, for another year uh, for dry, ga dry gas producers. There was some talk of, you know, you can't wring blood from a stone. Uh, we've been told that not all of these companies are broker insolvent. So 
why wouldn't you insist that companies that can pay do pay their tax bills? Well, of course I insist that companies uh, pay their tax bills. Uh, my point was, in, in some instances, I was asked a couple of weeks ago about some companies that no longer can pay their bills. If they're in a negative cash flow position and their balance sheet has been run down, uh, and they go to a municipality and say, you know, can we do it, work out a deferral or something? Sometimes the choice is between that and shutting down the operation and having zero revenue. So obviously, we 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 uh, uh, underscore that 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 we expect all companies to be good corporate citizens to pay their taxes on time. My point is, at, we are in a very challenging economic environment, and when there's some companies that are have laid off all the staff they can. They can't borrow any more money. They can't raise any money on the equity markets, and their balance sheet has been nuked. Um, that's a reality that we can't just ignore. We have to work. On, we have to work on that. I want to. We'll take more questions. I want to apologize to the Glenbow folks for no questions on the uh, <laughs> announcement. This is how it rolls. This is, well, this is welcome to my world. So, all right, carry on. I'm, I'm going to stay on that train. I'm sorry. I'm, okay. I am a Glenbow member, but I'll okay, so have a question off. about that. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to that uh, letter from those Nobel laureates, and I just wanted to clarify a little bit. Like, is, your, is your sense that these 40 Nobel laureates, many in you know, the fields of physics and chemistry, have been sort of sucked into this, um, you know, what you've called an extreme foreign financed campaign to landlock energy here? I mean, have they been sucked into that? Is that, your, is that what I, you're I, saying? Well, Boy, that is a valiant effort to put words into my mouth. No, no, I did not say that. <laughs> I did not intimate that. I said I suspect many of them did not, dis, uh, did, did not have before them the full uh, facts on this case because uh, the opponents of this mine uh, don't want people to know the full facts. The opponents of this mine don't want people to know that this would be the lowest emitting oil sands project in history. They don't want, the opponents don't want people to know that this would be uh, one of the lowest emitting uh, oil, oil field projects in North America. The opponents don't want people in Europe or elsewhere to know that 14 for 14 uh, proximate First Nations support this project. And the opponents certainly don't want folks to realize that in the real world we have a choice between Canadian energy and OPEC dictatorship energy. According to the International Energy Agency, uh, there will be a growing demand for crude oil between now and, and over the next two decades, and a significant increase in natural gas demand. Uh, even in the IEA's most pessimistic uh, scenario for oil consumption, which is a what they call their fully Paris-compliant sustainable projection for 2040, they project that year, I believe, 67 uh, million barrels of oil being consumed in 2040. Um, either those 67 million barrels come from a rights-respecting liberal democracy with the highest environmental human rights and labor standards on earth, i.e. Canada, or they come from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela, and Vladimir Putin's Russia. I think the global environment, human rights, labor rights, political stability would all be better off with projects like Frontier supplying that energy rather than Vladimir Putin or the, or the, or the, the uh, OPEC dictators. Sure, just to, just to follow up though, so I mean, wittingly or unwittingly, it's, it's your sense that these Nobel laureates have been drawn in to that campaign. It, that's my question. I, look, I, 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 don't, I haven't read the letter. All I know is that there's, there's letters like this signed not infrequently. Uh, and what we have seen, I can tell you this much, what we've seen engaging with European capital markets on some of these issues is uh, that there is, in dealing with the questions around environmental, social, and governance metrics for investment in, in energy, uh, there has been a, a great deal of misinformation. Uh, many uh, uh, interest groups have been misrepresenting the Canadian oil sands as being the equivalent of uh, thermal coal, for example which is manifestly ridiculous. It is counterfactual. Here's my view. Why would these groups, why would they focus single-mindedly, obsessively, with shutting down Canadian energy while giving OPEC and Russia a pass? I think the question answers itself. It's because there's no way they could cause the Saudis, the Iranians, the Venezuelans, or the Russians to shut in their energy. Our own prime minister said that no country with 170 billion barrels of oil would leave it in the ground. 
Um, and uh, what our challenge, and I'll be saying more about this next Monday, our challenge is to show the world the path forward uh, about how we can extract energy with a shrinking environmental and carbon footprint. That's exactly what we'll do. Thanks. So that was a yes, though. They're, they're part of it. <laughs> Thank you. Premier, I was wondering if you expect you will get an opportunity to meet with the Prime Minister to discuss the concerns about the uh, blockades? Uh, likely not, uh, I, but we did speak to him last night. Uh, uh, all 13 Premiers uh, joined the Prime Minister in a conference call. Um, I expressed our grave concern. Um, I underscored that um, it, not only is this having devastating impacts on, our, on, on working people today, uh, it is scaring away investment from this country. Uh, it is suggesting that we cannot operate as a modern democratic country based on the rule of law. I also underscored that um, we need, in the, in the spirit of reconciliation, we as, as, as elected government leaders need to demonstrate respect for the democratic decision-making process of our First Nations people. There have been 10 tribal council elections amongst, in the Wet'suwet'en communities over the past uh, uh, decade, all of which have resulted in councils that and chiefs who support the Coastal Gas Link project. And I'm very concerned that we not end up undermining the legitimate elected authority of, of First Nations leaders uh, uh, in a case like this. Um, I also underscored that uh, if uh, I'm concerned that if the if we see in some areas police not enforcing court orders, then increasingly uh, I'm concerned that citizens may do so. We've seen elements of that already, and I would much rather that the that the trained and properly authorized police ensure that court orders are enforced and the rule of law is maintained. Any assurances from the prime minister? Uh, the prime minister told us last night that. Um, the government of Canada's patience is wearing thin. Uh, he said that uh, he uh, believes that, that action is required within uh, uh, hours and not days, that they continue to try to reach out to uh, some of these protesters. Uh, but I got the impression that, uh, that the government of Canada understands that, that action will need to be taken. Just, no. just one tech question. <laughs> uh, they, they announced this morning that uh, they'll be uh, looking at a $1.3 billion write down if the mine isn't, isn't. That's right, because they've invested that much in the project to date. Does that mean anything for investment for other companies? Well, it, it, it would look, if tech is vetoed, it, it, it would send a devastating message to prospective investors in this country. And um, I, as I said to the prime minister in December, if they veto this project, then his comment about phasing out the oil sands apparently becomes the policy of the government of Canada. And that would be completely intolerable to the people of Alberta, which is why I said if that happens, our action will be swift and serious. Bonjour, Monsieur Kenny. Bonjour. Uh, J'aimerais savoir, uh, c'est quoi votre impression le, par rapport à la déclaration de Buffalo qui a été uh, uh, envoyée hier le, par uh, les quatre députés albertains? Par qui? Par les quatre, par Michel Rumpel et oh, les ça. albertains. Oui. Alors, euh, écoute, notre gouvernement a été élu sur un mandat pour, de à lutter pour l'Alberta et pour la justice à l'intérieur de la Fédération canadienne. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous faisons les consultations auprès des Albertains et euh, nous avons déjà pris l'action. Nous poursuivons le gouvernement fédéral en cours contre l'imposition de taxes sur le carbone fédéral et contre le projet de loi C-69 euh, contre les oléoducs et euh, euh, dans plusieurs autres euh, égards, alors à la suite de, euh, de consultations sur le, le marché juste pour l'Alberta, euh, prendre, nous prendrons davantage des actions pour défendre la province. Alors, plusieurs... Je crois que la lettre euh, de Mme Rimpel souligne qu'il y a une euh, inquiétude grave et profonde ici en Alberta Ça souligne la frustration et ça, ça renforce pourquoi le fédéral doit prendre l'action pour démontrer qu'il y a un avenir économique pour cette province. 
Et par rapport à la rencontre, justement, avec Justin Trudeau, là, par rapport au blocage hier, qu'est-ce que vous trouvez qui est sorti de cette réunion-là? Et puis, est-ce que vous êtes satisfait de cette, cette discussion? J'ai pris l'impression que le premier ministre et les gouvernements du Canada perdent euh, la, la patience en ce qui concerne euh, ces euh, blocages illégaux de nos chemins de fer et de notre économie nationale. Et moi et plusieurs autres premiers ministres euh, provinciaux ont exigé que le premier ministre prenne action pour défendre les règles du droit euh, et euh, les emplois au Canada. Merci. This will be the last question. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Premier, we're aware of the, the work that's being done by the, uh, the uh, Fair Deal panel, but I was wondering if you've had a chance to read this Buffalo Declaration and do you support it? Um, you know, what, what I support is uh, this government delivering on our mandate to Albertans, which is exactly what we're doing to fight for the province against the, the imposition of the federal carbon tax against C-69. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we have put, we've put out the most constructive ideas uh, for getting a fair deal in the Canadian Federation. And I've been clear that we are prepared to accelerate those proposals, many of them, if we uh, get a, a, a veto on the Tech Frontier project that has been approved according to the highest environmental standards after a 10-year-long regulatory process. Uh, so I think what that letter underscores is, uh, because I, I have not read it in detail, but I think what the letter underscores is the depth of frustration. A lot of people are going to come to the table with a lot of different ideas and a lot of commentary, all of it underscores that the frustration of this province is deep and genuine. Okay? I'm sorry to Glenbow folks that there were no questions, but hopefully there will be. No, I actually have, have last question, question about the Glenbow. Oh, voila, oh. okay, we can. But it's in French. <laughs> Euh, bonjour, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Donc, j'ai une question sur okay. le Glenbow. Vous avez dit que ça allait créer des emplois. Est-ce qu'on parle uniquement d'emplois temporaires pendant le, la phase de construction Est-ce que ça va créer des emplois sur le long Principalement, terme Principalement, évidemment, ça serait les emplois de construction, euh, quelques centaines des emplois euh, pendant une période, je crois, de deux ans de, de rénovation, de construction. Mais ça serait un élargissement de la musée à, à, à long terme. Et je crois que ça va représenter une... une Uh, les, les uh, nouvelles occasions uh, pour les emplois, but I better not commit to that. Nicholas, the question is, are you, do you speak French? Uh, are you guys going to, <laughs> is this project, <laughs> apart from construction, going to create new jobs? Yes, so thank you very much for the question. I hope you won't mind if I answer in English. Okay. Uh, apart from the construction work, uh, we have developed a new business plan that will see us go through the renovation and into a period of increased sustainability, and we project that that will create several permanent positions. The precise number will be defined in the coming months, but there will be new jobs at Glenbow. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone.